Hello, hello. Welcome back. Final Fantasy 1 Red Mages Only was a fine challenge, doing a pretty good job of being consistent throughout despite the quirks of Final Fantasy 1. Today, the Red Mage Only train will keep on running through in Final Fantasy 3. This game was notably excluded from my Black Mages Only series, at least the comments thought it was notable and asked me quite a bit, which is why I put out the only short on my channel, at least at time of recording. But the biggest reason I excluded it was some of the gimmicky bosses and lack of healing that Black Mages would have had. While Red Mages getting black and white magic at least healing isn't hopeless, though there are still gimmicky fights to work through. Let's hope I don't regret including Final Fantasy III in this series. And we begin by falling into a cave. We don't have access to our jobs yet, so we are just stuck with our adorable little Onion Knights. Look at their cute little outfits. Then do a quick few fights next to this healing spring to get the levels I want to face the first boss, which is very simple and just requires attacking repeatedly. This nets us the blessing of the first crystal and our job class for this run, Red Mage. Just like in Final Fantasy 1, Red Mages are a mixed bag, having access to black magic, white magic, and martial prowess. And how well the games balance these many factors is a topic I will be getting into. I next head to our first town and buy daggers for everyone, because red mages can't use longswords for some reason? That's not great. And the only spell available to purchase is Poisona, which is basically completely worthless because antidotes exist. Yeah, Final Fantasy III has a very weird opinion on access to magic early on, but by exploring we get a single cure spell, so a single red mage will be able to heal. It's very weird that the game gives you access to three different mages immediately, and you can acquire basically no spells until you start going through the game's dungeons. But it's already on to the next town, where everyone is a ghost. And then we head to the desert to get an airship. Already! Which may be a record in Final Fantasy history. Heading to the nearby castle, we can start stealing even more stuff. And wow! That cure cast did not heal very much. And we pick up our only offensive spell, Blizzard. Our first mission is to take down a Jin to rescue the ghost cursed town and castle inhabitants. I do need to do some leveling first, and it doesn't go super great. I always forget how much the first dungeon does not mess around in this game. Meet up with Princess Arya for the 15 seconds she'll be following us around, and it's time for the next boss. I'm very limited in spells, which is why I stockpiled the Antarctic Wind items that are available in the early areas. By spamming these, I can end the first boss in a single round. Probably a little overkill, but you can't take the items with you. Jin dead, the curse is lifted, and we can head back to Kazus. Here, I can finally pick up Cure, Fire, and Blizzard magic, so I actually have some spell access. Then, this game's resident Sid wants to help us on our journey and get himself home. By fashioning a giant drill to the front of our ship, yeah, I'm not sure what you expected to happen there, bud. Takes it home and give an elixir to his sick wife. This gets us access to his stash, which is mostly just healing items. Nothing exciting, but useful regardless. Time to climb Bahamut Mountain. The enemies aren't too bad, other than that they all cause petrification. And our first second level spell, Arrow. We then end up in Dragon Nest and meet up with Dash and fight Bahamut. And I actually forget you have to run rather than lose this fight, so, uh, whoops. Party jumps off the mountain and somehow ends up so very far away. At least there is a healing spring, hinting at our next destination. Except I actually have to grind a bit because I don't have the MP to cast mini even once. But once I can, I arrive in just the tiniest little village. From here, we can access a path through an underground cave and arrive on the western island and head into Viking's Cove. Here, I can start stocking up on some very limited level 2 magic before finding all the free level 3 magic I could want, albeit I won't be able to cast any of these for a decent amount of time. My new ship is ambushed by an angry sea dragon, and it's time for our next dungeon, the Nepto Temple. And I have to be fully minied for the entire dungeon. So, push my party to the back row to balance the physical damage I take, and get ready to spam magic. Our next boss is a giant rat! My magic damage is looking okay, and the boss doesn't hit too hard. It is in this fight I realize that magic damage is just as inconsistent as physical damage in this game. And also magic can miss. 
So yay! I do not like either of these pieces of information. And the first fight does not go my way. For a number of reasons, mostly that I just need a few more levels to up my magic damage. Back to the Pirate Cove to rest, I remove and relearn all my magic to better balance what spells I have. I will do this several times before the game is over. Spells adjusted and a bit more experience, and it's back to the giant rat. I tried to blind or poison it, and neither sticks, so I have no choice but to just spam level 1 black magic and hope that's enough. It takes a while, but I get lucky with the giant rat missing a lot, so I don't have to heal very much. This gives me the Nepto Eye to calm down the angry sea monster. And now that I have a boat, it is time to move on. First, to the Village of the Ancients, which has all the level 3 spells. I don't actually have any spell slots to cast. Then the Weapon Shop, which has some better equipment for my Red Mages. Next, we go to Castle Argus. No plot here yet, but I can rob the place. Then head into this unassuming cave and get the Toad Magic. And an Ice Rod. And a Flame Rod. Sadly, these can't be broken for massive damage, but they do still boost the damage of elemental spells, which will help our comparatively low damage output. Next, I encounter a little bit of an issue, because I need to cast Toad to get into the next dungeon, and then Toad again once inside. I do not have two level 2 spell slots, so time for a bit of grinding to get the bare minimum I need to get through the next section. Yes, I know I could move Toad to a different character, but I think me being underleveled is still going to be a bit of a problem if I don't get some experience. That done, I can finally access the Tower of Owen proper. Dungeon is pretty boring, and I reach Medusa without issue. First thing is to check whether Blizzard or Physical Attacks are more damaging. And the answer is Physical Attacks, except for one Red Mage that has an Ice Rod equipped. From there, it is a careful balance of curing petrification, healing up for Medusa's magic attacks, and just spamming Blizzard in attack as much as possible. And Medusa goes down pretty easily. Other than a few fights, I'm not really expecting this run to be too bad, at least not until the end. The Tower of Owen has been stabilized, so the Outer Sea is now open. I head to Gisal. Here I can buy magic keys to open locks, and magic that's too high a level for me to cast. There is also a shuriken I can sell for almost 40,000 gil. I can't throw it, so it's just money to me. And I take my boat to the Dwarven Hollows, where I buy some better helmets and the turfing swords. Which you're going to need to get used to, because it is the best sword Red Mages can equip in this entire game. And if that sounds concerning to you, it should. Time to become frogs again and dive into the waters below the Dwarven Hollow. Another nothing dungeon, and it's time for the next boss, Gutsko. I don't have any great damaging option, but the game does let me change equipment mid-fight. I start by cycling the Ice Rod around my party to boost the damage of my very small number of Blizzaras while the rest of my party attacks. Once I run out of Blizzaras, I equip an Ice Staff, acquired from the Village of the Ancients, and an Ice Rod. Ice Staves can be used in combat to cast Blizzard for free, letting me save my limited spell casts for healing. Takes a bit of time, but Gutsko drops. Why do the bosses in this game seem to have so much HP? With Gutsko dead, I can enter the Fire Cave, or whatever it's called in this game, and already at the next boss, Salamander. Start the fight the same way as Gutsko, swapping the Ice Rod around to boost the damage of my Blizzaras. Except, oof. Salamander has Flame, which is dealing big damage to my entire party. Cura can keep pace with the damage, but I do not have very many Curas to work with. While I managed to keep pace with Salamander's damage for a while, I just don't have the healing I need to keep up. Okay, I've been avoiding fights, and it is time to stop doing that and get some more levels and try again. Level 4 spell slots and Blizzaga acquired, and it's time to head back in. Start off with the same rod swapping strategy as before, but this time with Blizzaga rather than Blizzara. That lets me deal some big hits early. Salamander's Flame still deals chunky damage to my whole party, but I do have a bit more healing than before. Shame it's still not very good. It still gets really close with my offensive options limited and reduced to casting Cure repeatedly to keep my party alive as long as possible. But it is long enough. Not by much, though. Is my damage bad, or are these bosses just really tanky? I'm leaning towards the latter, as it looks like they all got HP bumps from the original game. Oops, and we are randomly captured, and it's time for Castle Hein. 
a section I was not looking forward to, because it brings me to the first boss I was kind of worried about, Ein himself. Ein has a whole mechanic where he sets up a barrier which makes him weak to fire, ice, or bolt, but then absorbs the other two elements. What the game wants you to do is make a character a scholar to take advantage of their free scan ability to identify the weakness as the barrier changes. Except I obviously cannot do that, and while Libra is a spell, it is a fourth level spell. So instead I need to get creative. And I do figure out an idea. I have one of each of the elemental staves acquired from the Village of the Ancients. These cast fire, thunder, or blizzard on use. Once Hein shifts his barrier, I can use all three rods to see what type of damage he absorbs and is weak to. He will heal a bit from the level 1 spells, but once his weakness is identified, I can unleash stronger spells on the next round to deal damage. And this strategy actually works quite well. It would definitely be faster if I could see his weakness, but a quick test of the barrier gives me all the info I need to capitalize on. And his attacks and barrier switching falls into a predictable rhythm I can exploit to get the victory. I was really expecting that fight to be way more difficult, but it just required some problem solving. That completed, I can head back to Castle Argus, get the Wheel of Time, and then talk to Sid. And huzzah, my boat is now also an airship. Airship in hand, I can descend from the floating island to the drowned world below. Rescue the Water Priestess Arya, and it's time for our next dungeon, the Cave of Tides. Boring dungeon, and it's boss time. Kraken. Kraken has strong single target damage, and all my spells are missing. I do still try to make this fight work, and it uh, goes pretty awful, so time to reset. I am hilariously underleveled for this point in the game, so it's time to do some grinding to get back up to where the game expects me to be. I actually try to grind at the dungeon itself and get bodied by a random mob. So uh, world map grinding it is. Levels gain, spells switched around, and we're back. This time, everyone has Thundara, not just two people, and because Kraken is weak to lightning, Thundara is dealing big damage. Usually. Once Thundara is out, switch to basic thunder, and the fight actually ends very quickly. Okay, dokey. Spamming thunder magic did in fact get the job done here. I love that for me. Water crystal restored, and we are rescued and in this random inn. The surface world has been restored, and we've got a lot of work we still need to do. Check the armor and weapon shops, and they have new stuff. None of which we can equip, because, uh, red mages aren't really supposed to be used this late in the game? Which is going to start being a problem. We head into the town sewer and rescue some men from some monsters. But I didn't actually realize, but these were basic goblins. So I blew them away with Blizzaga, which was a bit over the top. Then get these levergrass shoes from this woman which I need for the Southern Marsh, which I definitely knew before coming down here. And thanks to those shoes, we can reach the Golden Manor. A manor with a bunch of gold all over the place, and our next boss, Goldor. Goldor is highly resistant to magic, so I must rely on my physical attacks, which goes real bad considering my best attacking weapon is several dungeons out of date, and I will never get any better ones. It also doesn't help that I am, as ever, underleveled. So it is time, once again, to grind up some XP to get my character's levels more in line with the game's expectations. Levels acquired, and it's time for the boss again. My strategy is basically the same, just spam physical attacks and occasionally take breaks to heal up wounded party members. My party is more durable than before, but I am a bit hindered in healing by the fact that this game's turn order is, as best I can tell, completely random. This makes healing characters after the boss hits, but before they hit again, kind of tricky. And by tricky, I mean it just doesn't happen. Anyway, the levels I got made all the difference, and I won the fight. It wasn't interesting in any way, just kind of tedious. I've reached the point in some challenges where I must wonder if this game is even good. Time for us to explore Saronia by getting shot out of the sky. Saronia is a very big city, state, nation thing, and exploring each of the four sections is important. Because there is a war on, many of the shops around the area are closed, but a few shops and areas are open that give us a fun amount of items specific to dragoons. The next boss is one I am actually quite concerned about. Gruda is very strong, and the game very explicitly tells you to use dragoons in this fight. 
The boss is weak to the wind spears around the area, and the dragoon's jump ability protects your party from Garuda's strong attacks. I assume I'm going to get destroyed, but I hop in for a first attempt to, just to see where I'm at. So damage-wise, Arrow deals okay damage? It's not great, but the boss being wind weak means the damage is okay. But the boss being able to hit the party for big lightning damage is not okay. So it's time to get more levels. I'd love to do something more interesting, but I really don't have any options to do better. I gather enough experience to survive three lightnings with each character and hop back into the fight with Garuda. Arrow is dealing more damage, but equally important is that now I have time to use high potions to heal and not just be in a never-ending heal loop. Lightning is still a strong attack, and any turn Garuda uses a regular physical attack rather than lightning is a big boon, but that extra HP threshold gives me everything I need to keep my party alive while peppering the boss with spells, and I win! Okay, that was actually the boss fight I was most worried about, at least until the final series of fights, so it going as well as it did is a pretty nice confidence boost. Maybe including Final Fantasy III in the series wasn't a mistake. But now I've acquired my next airship and unlocked all the shops around Saronia. Most of these are just items my red mages can't benefit from in any way, but one of the weapon shops sells elemental rods to boost elemental damage and rune staves, which are the best weapon I can use in the game. For several reasons. Also level 5 spells! Now that I have the Nautilus, I can access Doga's Manor, and by heading through the Mushroom Circle Cave, I get a spell cast on the Nautilus, so it now functions as a submarine. No idea how or why that happens. This means it's time to explore some underwater caves. In the underwater cave by the Triangle Island, we find a bunch of chests full of items that aren't really very useful. And monsters. Then to the cave under Saronia, also full of unhelpful items. But I do transition to the combat style I'll be using for quite a while. Rune Staff in one hand for free Blizzaga, Ice Rod in the other to increase ice damage. Back row to reduce the melee damage my characters take. Errands completed, I can actually head for the Temple of Time and acquire a... loot? What is this doing down here? Take the loot to Une's shrine and wake her up with some sick loot solo. Une in tow, it's time for the Ancient Ruins. And there are shops here that actually sell some better armor. Too bad no better weapons. Ever. This dungeon, weirdly, has no boss, so just run straight through, and now I have the Invincible. One of the best airships in Final Fantasy. Mostly because it has an inn and item shop built into it. And yeah, the shops don't sell me anything I can actually use as Ren Mages, but it's still pretty cool to have an airship like this. Time for our next dungeon. This one is full of Dark Knights, who give me Dark Knight equipment. Nice hints, but not actually helpful for me. Fortunately, trekking through the dungeon is pretty uninteresting, and I arrive at the boss, Hecatoncare. Runestaff Blizzagas deal okay damage when boosted by Ice Rods, and the high potions I'm fully stocked up on heal pretty good. It's not foolproof, as if I'm injured and the boss double attacks the same target, I might still lose a mage, which definitely happens a few times, but the fight is surprisingly breezy. Given that the early classes have replacement jobs at later crystals, a thing red mages notably lack, I'm actually surprised red mage is still working at all. We'll see if that manages to carry us through the end game. Hecaton care defeated, I return to Doga's mana for a sequence of fights against Doga and Une, for some reason. I don't actually understand the point of this fight since neither of these characters even stays dead, but runestaff blizzagas are still dealing pretty good damage. And while Doga has Flare to deal big single target damage, I can manage to heal up from that pretty effectively. Une hops in right after without even letting me heal, which is not the best, but I can get my party back up to roughly full before bringing the fight back to her, and while she also has Holy and some strong buffs, it isn't really enough to do anything against my constant stream of Blizzagas. And it's almost the end of the game, but first, time to fight Titan. Technically, I don't think we even need to do this fight, as it just unlocks the Earth Crystal, which I do not care about, but why not? Titan has strong physical attack, so I get to use my only buff in this fight, Protect, to boost physical resistances. But just like in Final Fantasy 1, I'm a little unclear how effective this actually is, especially when Titan loves using Quake to hit the entire party and completely bypass Protect. Also, why does this sprite look like a small child's head was grafted onto an adult man? That's weird. 
Can't help but notice that my Blizzalgus are not doing a great amount of damage here. Hope that isn't a sign of things to come. Time to pass through the Maze of the Ancients, in which nothing interesting happens. And to the Crystal Tower. First thing to do is to use the Eureka Key to unlock Eureka. There are some nice items here, but most of them I cannot use. And some chess monsters that have so much HP, it's frankly offensive. Or maybe it was just that my damage is crap. There are strong weapons locked behind optional bosses, but I don't bother fighting any of them, because Red Mages cannot equip any of them. At the end are three sages that sell mostly crap I don't need, but the third, hidden one, sells crystal armor, which thankfully I can equip. Still no better weapons, but crystal defense will have to do. Eureka completed, in heavy air quotes, it's time for the crystal tower proper. More dungeon that isn't that interesting, full of items that aren't really all that helpful. Then five big dragons that will kill us, but Doga, who we killed earlier, shows up to collect our friends to hold off the dragons through the power of pure hearts, I think. And it's time for the first boss in an overly long sequence of bosses. And Zande more or less stomps my party into the curb. Zande is a powerful spellcaster, and I'm still a lower level than I really should be. He can basically destroy the party with all target spells, and my damage is pretty bad, whether Blizzagas or regular attacks. But I am only level 41, so that is, uh, unsurprising. Hmm, my next gameplay recording section is called Suffering. That's probably not great. I've leveled up to 45, and I'm just going to keep trying the Zande fight until it goes better. Leveling up between each attempt. And level 45 is a bust. I still hit like a wet noodle, and Zande hits like the noodle truck I bought them at. And while Shining Curtains can reflect some of Zande spells, Reflect then expires, and I only have like 6 curtains total. Up to level 50, and I head back. Does it go better? Yes. Does it go well? No. Not even slightly. In one turn, my red mages can deal about 1200 damage, which means I'd need 25 to 30 full turns to bring him down. I get about 10 before he destroys me. Back to the level grind! Level 55, I'm slightly stronger and a bit more durable. And I'm dead. Zande just deals so much damage, and I have so little damage and so few resources. Back to the grind! Oh good, this next recording is labeled More Suffering. So I'm real sick of this long run back and forth to level, run through two dungeons, and then get stomped by the boss. So while it may have been overkill, I got my entire party to level 70. That's right, a 15 level jump from my last attempt and it finally goes better. But it also goes slowly. I have over twice as much HP as my prior attempts, and my damage and healing are pretty good, but my damage is still not great. So while I can generally keep my characters healthy, this fight also takes a long time. And it's not really challenging or interesting, it's just long and boring. But eventually Zande does go down, and now it's time for the real challenge the world of darkness, and the four crystal guardians within. First up is Cerberus. There are no interesting mechanics to this fight. Just like Zande, it's spam Thundaga until I run out, then spam Blizzaga until the boss is dead. And because this boss has 100,000 HP, that takes a while. And if it feels like I'm glossing over the fight, it's because I am. The fight against Cerberus took 15 minutes by itself, and nothing remotely interesting happened even once. And the next Crystal Shade is Echidna, which takes minimal damage from my spells, has 100,000 HP, and spams high-level offensive magic. Why does that feel so familiar to me? It's a mystery. She can cast Death that I have to recover from, and I will also be glossing over this fight because it took a full 20 minutes. And these were not interesting minutes. Next is Ahriman. Would anyone in the audience like to guess how this fight goes? Oh, it spams high-level offensive magic, has 100,000 HP, and takes piddling damage from my attacks? Who could have guessed? I fought this stupid boss for 10 minutes, and then this happened. That's right. This can cast 
Kiraja, healing over 5,000 HP and setting me back several turns in one fell swoop. This broke something in me. From fighting Zande to here took over an hour. I am an hour into this recording and I've only beaten three of the last six bosses. I am not doing this again. Not more than once, that is. So here are my final stats. That's right, I'm level 99 with every character and level 99 job level with every character. I'm going to do this one more time and that is it. First is Zande, who still takes so very little damage. The difference is I have about 9,000 HP and my healing has improved dramatically. That's right, Zande. That's what this feels like. Then, into the world of darkness, rather than showing these fights individually, I'm going to put them all on screen at once while I complain. For those unaware, compared to the NES release, all of these bosses have three to four times as much HP. They're all at 99,999? Why did they do that? I get that HP was increased in the DS remake, but there is no excuse for porting that to the Pixel Remaster when your characters are weaker. This isn't fun. This isn't engaging. There isn't even anything I can really do to make this faster. The game does have consumables that can deal damage or buff allies, but you get so few for free and then can only be gotten as rare drops from certain enemies. That's not fun. That's not good. It just means even when I'm so overleveled it's comical, the final fights are boring and tedious, which they already were at a more reasonable level. Are these stupid fights over? Oh, still, no. That's fine, FF3. We'll wait. Surely my audience has nothing better to do. Oh, you're done, good. And now it's time for the final fight against Cloud of Darkness. Did you think this would be interesting? Why? Well, while that wraps up in the background, I guess I'll get that outro handled. I hope you enjoyed this video. I definitely enjoyed most of it. But if you did enjoy the video, feel free to drop a like. If you'd like to see more of this, I would welcome you to subscribe. If you have anything of interest to say, drop a comment. Particularly if you have any advice to make the last segment of this game suck less. Especially considering the lack of offensive options and very limited access to consumables that could be used. While I wanted to beat this game without leveling to 99, the final section still took almost 40 minutes at max level so I regret nothing. Tune in next week where I will be continuing the Red Mages Only train in Final Fantasy V. Let's hope it sucks less. But regardless, have a safe trip home. <laughs>